I welcome you back uh, on our panel on Merchant Renewables in Germany, Reality or a Pipe Dream, where I want to discuss uh, the current and future role that subsidy-free renewables may play in Germany. I'm delighted that the following distinguished speakers have joined me today's discussion. Um, first, first is uh, Radu Bruescu, who is leading the European onshore and wind and solar investments at Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. That's one of the largest uh, dedicated energy infrastructure in investors. Prior to uh, joining Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, Radu was a director for renewable energy investments at uh, Terra Firma, and prior to that worked for Centrica, uh, UK, UK utility. He started his career in the energy sector in uh, 2002, when he joined the energy investment bank in team of JP Morgan. Prior to uh, CIP, Radu was also um, active in, in all these fields, not only uh, renewables uh, per se, but also um, geothermal, so, so broad expertise. I'm, I'm happy to have you here today on the panel. Thank you for joining. Glad to be here. Thank you. Next uh, is Tim Kudermann, who is leading the, uh, the coverage team of Commerzbank's Center of Competence for Renewable Energies with global relationship management responsibility for project finance as well as corporate clients in the sector. Tim has more than 10 years experience in project finance uh, in the renewable space and predominantly worked on industries scale national and international wind on, on and on offshore as well as on PV and CSP transactions. Uh, before joining Commerzbank, Tim has worked as a strategy consultant in the energy space for Roland Berger and Accenture. And also thanks a lot, Tim, for joining and, and bringing the, the depth perspective onto this panel. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Last, but of course not least, is uh, Dr. Benedikt Ortmann, who's heading the business entity solar project at Baivare. And he's also the managing uh, director of the Baivare Solar Projects uh, GmbH. Benedikt has uh, 20 years of experience in the energy sector, of which he spent 10 years at Baiva, where he developed the, the practically non-existing solar division into a global business unit with an international pipeline. This also includes the very first uh, utility scale subsidy free solar project. Before uh, joining Baiva, uh, Benedict Ortmann was uh, at Solan AG and also the CFO of the SAG Solarstrom AG. Um, Thank you very much for joining and, and having a, such a pioneer here on, on board of our panel. Thanks for inviting. Thank you. Yeah, so far, so, so well. My name is Casimir Lawrence. I'm a project leader at Aurora in our Berlin office and responsible for our activities in the renewable space. Next to that, I would like to, um, for those who hadn't had the time to join our presentation, Earlier on, I would like to give a quick recap of what were the main takeaways of this presentation and uh, which will also be to some extent, of course, discussed during this panel here. Um, the, the presentation was called Trade-offs in the German Energy Transition, Market-Based Build-Out versus uh, Climate and Renewable Targets. The, the two main things that we have learned there were that reaching the 65% target in Germany, which is the renewable target until 2030, and phasing out subsidies by 2027 is unlikely to work together because of uh, su not sufficient uh, revenues at that point. On the other hand, what, what could be possible to actually make them compatible would be higher CO2 prices. And we have seen that CO2 prices in, in a base case would be around about 120 euros, so significantly high CO2 prices. And um, even in a, in a very positive um, development of uh, technology and lifetime and so forth, even a CO2 price of 60 euros would still be necessary in order to have subsidies being phased out in 2027 and at the same time reach our climate target. 60 euros in contrast is, let's say, uh, still debatable if that's the that's CO2 price we will reach until 2030. It's clearly on the higher end. Um, however, when we, of course, combine a very positive view on CO2 price is a very positive view on technology, on lifetime financing conditions. You, you see, we're getting to a point where we really need everything to work out to really make that happen. So that's the situation we, we have presented so far. And before we start with the panel, uh, a few housekeeping points. Um, as always, if you want to ask us some questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, we will make sure we, after, uh, we answer them after the session. So. Uh, 
please feel free and we are very much looking forward to, to your comments. Um, yeah, so far I would like to uh, finish with the formalities and, and really start diving into the content where uh, everybody is eager to go into the, the discussions. Um, we have prepared some questions and uh, the first question I would like to address to, to all of you and I'm in, uh, delighted to start the, the discussion with the first question, a bit more uh, general, on what is your view and your perception of the current state of subsidy-free renewable investments in Germany? Um, maybe as we have been introduced the last one, maybe Benedikt Altman, please go, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, uh, well, what is the status of subsidy in Germany right now, subsidy-free? We are actually doing it already today. <clears throat> and I see many of my competitors, of our competitors, also uh, developing hardly on big um, pipelines. And we also get the reception from many municipalities that many developers are knocking at their doors for additional capacity for greenfield developments. So I think actually, I think uh, the subsidy free market in Germany is taking off. Mm -hmm. And maybe as a quick follow up question to that, what would you say is the, the reasoning why it is attractive to develop um, subsidy free renewables when there is still the uh, an available, subsidy, available subsidy scheme in Germany as, as we have the options now even until 20 megawatts after the, the last EG reform? Yeah, very relevant question. The reason is that, I mean, the, uh, the framework of the EEG is really limiting us in many aspects. Um, it's, it is the, the, the possible sites we can use. It is the, the maximum of size we can, we can have, which is right now like 20 megawatts. So these kind of limiting factors are, um, yeah, are standing in our way because when you want to have a, a grid parity Uh, subsidy-free um, site, you need to have like minimum like 50 megawatt plus. Mm -hmm. And this is not possible, simply not possible under the EEG. Okay. Very interesting. I, I have a lot of points where I would like to come back, but maybe we give the, the chance first uh, to, to Tim, maybe to, to also tell us about his standpoint with regards to the current status of subsidy-free renewable investments in Germany and how, how that the status looks for you, maybe also on, on your personal uh, experience at the moment. Yep, um, I guess uh, Benedict is right um, for the PV space and there especially for the larger scale installations above 20 megawatts. That's definitely a trend that has picked up over the past one to two years driven by even lower um, levelized cost of energy and at the same time, um, probably also availability of long, longer term PPAs, that there, there's, um, there seems to be um, a bit of an offer in terms of PPAs from utilities. Um, we're providing 10 to 15 year PPAs and then also Deutsche Bahn has been active and a few other um, large uh, corporate players. So there, there is um, space for, uh, for a merchant driven build out. But from an overall perspective, if I look at the wind space and, and then also wind offshore, there has been this one exception where we have the transitional auction where we, where we saw zero bits, but we do not expect that to continue um, in the future. So it, I think um, if you look over the whole renewable space, then um, subsidy free is still a niche, um, which is getting bigger, argue, arguably, but it's not the majority of projects being realized in Germany at this point in time. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your view on that. And I, um, I'm curious to, to just follow up directly with Radu and, and your, your view on the current situation. Yeah, I, I, I would concur, right? I think it is, uh, we probably need to make a difference between, uh, between uh, subsidy free and, and total merchant. I think the, the current growth in, in subsidy free is driven either by uh, PPAs, by private PPAs, or by internalized PPAs from, from utilities that have a supply obligation and, and, and are looking to, um, uh, to source uh, renewable power at, at uh, low LCOE. Um, I, it, it is also right that, that uh, uh, the, the demand is driven by, by corporates who are looking to, to decarbonize directly their, their, uh, their power, uh, power generation supply. 
Um, so, so that is certainly uh, good to see. Um, and this trend is likely to continue as, uh, as, as the solar in particular, but also the wind sector continue to, to lower the, the LCOE and, and become more and more uh, competitive. Thank you. So, so may, maybe to summarize so far the picture that, that I have seen here on the panel and maybe trying to challenge it also a bit before get, getting some, some further follow-up questions on that. So you're saying that we do see renewable build out happening without subsidies. Of course, a lot of that or all of that so far uh, being backed up by, by PPAs. And um, that, that's a view that I, I would clearly share. Um, maybe also relating to what we have seen before, um, when we come back to the, the cost perspective and the, the revenue perspective, uh, ba based on the assumption, maybe quite some conservative ones that we, we have seen here at Aurora, we, we predict an, an, an unlevered return on, so project return between, uh, in, in the good case, uh, four and a half percent, in the bad case, maybe even going uh, down, even in a scenario where we don't reach our, our climate targets. Um, so that's the first point I would, would maybe like to discuss with you. How do you see these risks? And, and we come back to that in a second later. But before that, a uh, uh, question to, to Mr. Ortman that, that you said after 50 megawatts is the, is the border where it really makes a difference uh, or from where on you have this, the scale effects. Um, the, the, the numbers that we have shown uh, before in our presentation were, of course, for a, a smaller park. Um, however, the, the numbers were still quite quite optimistic there. Uh, what is the reasoning that we have this the scale scale up factor really when we go into the 50, 50 or more megawatts here? Yeah, there's two main parameters. One is, I mean, some costs are always the same regardless whether you develop a one megawatt or a one hundred megawatt project, such as you know planning, permission, uh, lease contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there is costs which are related to the size of the generator, which go in parallel to that. And there are costs then which go in steps, which is mainly the, the grid connection. For instance, when you are applying for a 20 kVA grid connection, you cannot in, in, in inject more than like 30 meg or 40 meg. And if you go on 50 and beyond, then you have to go on 110 kVA. So, and that's, that's of course, a, a step in cost because you have to build a bigger substation. So these kind of uh, cost structures are, are kind of the leading the way into the bigger, the better in terms of LCOE. Okay, so, so you would say maybe as a, a quick remark towards policy, this increasing from 10 megawatts to 20 megawatts doesn't really, was, was it an improvement? Does it actually change anything or? Well, it does improve, of course, the, um, the, the numbers a bit, but it's still not enough. And for that, I, I mean, you could say, this is the reason why we still have subsidies because for small scale installations, you would still need it in order to compensate for the, for the higher costs. But we see on the other side that landowners are asking simply for more money if the site is smaller <laughs> because they know you get subsidies. So uh, a certain portion of that is eaten up by other, let's say, stakeholders in the project. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's super interesting. And I think it also makes sense when we think about where are these subsidy-free solar projects planned. It's uh, mostly not in the areas where we have the most sun in Germany, but in the areas where we have the most land. Um, we, we have this famous project in, in somewhere in, in, in Brandenburg and that's <laughs> living in Berlin, knowing that it's clearly not the most sunniest area in Germany. Um, I think that that gives a very good explanation here. Um, that's true, but it's not so dark up there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a very, very Berlin based perspective uh, <laughs> a, a view on, <laughs> view on uh, how the surroundings are looking like. Yeah, and uh, thank you for, for that uh, for the details on, on the, the relevant sizes. Um, maybe also uh, to Radu and, and Tim now, what, what do you think like the, with regards to the return requirements and financeability, maybe starting with the return requirements, uh, Radu, what, what, what is the, the, the average uh, return that you need to get on such a project that, for example, has a 10-year PPA 
and um, then another 15 <clears throat> or even 20 or 25 years merchant tail. What, what are the revenues and oh, sorry, what are the returns, uh, return rates that you have to expect here and in the end also, also reach? Yeah, so we we have seen uh, we have seen the numbers earlier in the presentation, Kazimir, right? And um, on 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 based on Aurora assumptions, um, uh, the IRR, uh, the base case IRR is 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 very tight. Right? I think that the, there needs to be something else. That you know, the investors will need to believe in uh, different uh, power prices or a different cost base. Or a different capex that 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 allows them to 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 capture more commensurate uh, 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 returns from from such investments. I think overall, clearly for for Germany, there are uh, uh, a lot of positives and uh, uh, a lot of uh, attractive points. But at the same time, um, uh, the returns cannot remain decoupled from what investors can achieve elsewhere uh, for for uh, a long period of time. Um, so, so we shall see. And I think now, relative to other markets, I would say that uh, Germany probably is the uh, the beginning of of uh, subsidy free uh, renewables. Um, and uh, exactly how uh, cannibalization and capture rates will translate into into uh, capture power prices. Uh, uh, after the uh, after the expiry of the PPA, which by the way can, we assume that it's a it's a pay as produced PPA. So so uh, 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 after the end of the PPA period, what kind of realized power prices the the uh, solar PV project uh, is going to achieve? Um, that is probably the the big question mark out uh, out there, and it will depend a lot on on how disciplined the the investors uh, will be. Um, in order to avoid very strong uh, cannibalization effects across across the solar industry. Yeah, and, and maybe that direct question to Tim here, because we have been talking about the merchant tail to some extent now. So we have this 10 year of PPA, for example, and then um, there's, a, let's say, a 20 year merchant tail still. Um, with regards to the finance situation, also for the subsidy free assets, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of them or most of them are using external finance uh, and debt finance. So they, um, and it's, uh, that's maybe also a question afterwards to, to Mr. Ortman, but uh, the, the question here would be, if we have this 10 year PPA, how, how much security does that give you? And how long does the debt tenure goes? Do, do you go for 15 years? Do you even go for 20 years? Because then um, this question of how do the power prices develop is, is really, really an important one. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, regarding the PPAs, I mean, that obviously um, depends on the counterparty. So uh, what, what has to be evaluated there is the, the counterparty risk. Um, so um, if, if we assume that this is invest investment grade, as it is in most cases at this point in time, then we feel very comfortable with a 10-year PPA and also doing quite similar debt sizing on this period in time towards feed and driven, uh, compared to feed and um, driven projects. Um, thereafter, um, typically you would see um, debt financing periods between five to seven years in the, in the merchant tail. And then this obviously depends amongst others on the useful life of the asset. So while at wind, you will rather look at it maybe 25 years from a bank's perspective. Obviously, investors look different on that. Then um, on solar, we might even look at 30 years. Um, so there's then a different restructuring period, so to say. That wouldn't mean we would land into those periods, but we would, would, would feel comfortable that there is additional cash flow on the, on the, in the long run. But as you have said previously, I mean, determining capture rates for periods 17 years from now and then plus 10 is nearly impossible in, in a market which is changing such drastically as this market's all over Europe currently are. And so that's the question is, is there a positive cash flow after year 20? Uh, and where, if, how much, uh, if you look at it from a bank's perspective. And so um, what I would always like to point out here from, from a bank or from a project finance perspective is banks are not the best party in the overall mix 
to bear a lot of merchant risks because they are not the best ones to evaluate it and to properly price it. There are better parties out there who should be able to do that. And so that's why you will also, I mean, you, you can take it to a certain degree and that's what's happening in different markets, but not to, to an extent as we could do it with the feed and tiff project over 20 years, for example. I would agree, Tim. This is a, a mature investor's risk mm -hmm. uh, and not a bank's risk. But we see those rates as well. Uh, normally, we have like um, coverage uh, debt ratios of 50% ish. Um, and uh, also, terms which you were just describing, uh, also going beyond the period of, uh, of, the fix of, of the PPA. So, if you have a 15 year PPA, we also received a finance for 17 years because you know the, the last two years are not really uh, huge of a risk for a bank. Um, But we also see, of course, many investors just going for full equity. I mean, that's a reality right now as well. Yeah, and the reason for that being, I mean, cost of capital, because we can, we are not best positioned to judge this risk, we are very conservative in terms of debt sizing, in terms of pricing, et cetera, PP. And that's what you see there. And then there comes a certain point where you say, okay, leverage ratios aren't even sufficient to make sense and to, to justify all the efforts that goes into a project finance. And so there, I mean, that's, that's the, always the equilibrium that needs to be found if there's a project finance to be involved. Absolutely. And um, the, the, the most important uh, risk point you were already addressing is the counterparty risk. So if the, is the off taker of the PPA worth for kind of a 10 year credit or for, yeah. and when, when we go, of course, with uh, big counterparty companies like multinationals, Amazon and Googles of this world, it's all good. But if you want to have a PPA with the, uh, I don't know, bakery next door, then, then of course the problems are arising. And this is why we are, we actually were starting an initiative with uh, uh, other solar companies to say, if the German government will or would like to, um, to foster these kind of corporate PPA structures, it would be great if we could have a guarantee, a state guarantee for these PPAs coming from, I don't know, KFW or from whomever, that in case the off-taker would fall away, then they would have to step in at this price, right? The risk for the government would only be the difference between the, the market price and the PPA price. And that should be Uh, should be a, 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 let's say, bearable risk for, for the community. This yeah. is something which is really, would really foster uh, corporate PPAs a lot, I think. And of course, I can also imagine if, if you have, as a KFW, for example, will have a lot of clients, the risks are quite spread out so that... Exactly. Um, with my limited banking knowledge, I can imagine that if the risk spreads, it's not so bad. Um, But maybe coming a bit back because we have been talking or we have been saying now that even th there are cases people will go full equity. Um, however, what, what I still see a bit where maybe a bit more critical is um, that looking a bit forward, let's say in the next 10 years as a PPA, but then even afterwards, the 20 year asset lifetime, these the future prices, the future capture prices are, are really a big point. And I'm wondering, um, uh, like what different views can be there because we, we have seen in the presentation before that there could be a world where we reach the 65% target that would mean significantly more capacities in the system than we have right now. Significantly more capacities also mean a lot of cannibalization effects. Um, so I'm a, a bit skeptical when I would say now okay, we, we, we do see this merchant or the subsidy-free investment. We have a, maybe even a PPA that secures us for the next 10 years. But what we are currently seeing and what we have been seeing also in the last two, three years is that this government targets and the, the subsidized build-out of renewables has been pushed up and up and up. So we were, this, these targets have been increased for offshore, has been increased quite signif significantly so that um, expectations of investors at the moment right now um, may not not, not uh, be the same as they have been for for three years ago. So, um, my my question uh, to all of you would actually be like, how do you see the the German renewables market looking like in 2030? Do you think um, 
maybe generally, do you think we will reach our, um, our uh, renewable target, 65% of uh, gross production until 2030? And do you think uh, subsidy-free investments will play a major role there, especially for power PV, um, but also in, in general, we, we have talked about offshore auctions already beforehand. Um, yeah, maybe Radu, you want to give it a start? Yeah, maybe uh, I can I can start on on that. I think um, of course the question is uh, what is the production going to be in uh, 2030, and then we can have a debate whether 65 percent is 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 going to be achieved. But I I, I think there's no doubt that uh, renewables are going to become the the dominant contribution uh, to in the in the in the power generation sector uh, over the coming uh, coming decades. Um, and then indeed, uh, together with that, will we'll come the question, what are the realized prices that, that uh, assets outside the, the EEG and the feed-in tariff are, go, are going to achieve in that, uh, in that sector? Um, and it will be, of course, a, a, a rolling discussion as, uh, as assets co come off and are being repowered and are being reintegrated into the, into the, into the power mix. Uh, uh, new capacity comes on stream, and um, so so uh, there is there is a there is a very valid question: what kind of uh, what kind of power price assumptions do you underwrite for a for a long term uh, investment of uh, of twenty to thirty years? Um, of course, kind of on the on the first ten years. Um, the PPA of taker also wants to price that as as uh, as keenly as they can. They they are of course a, a buyer of power. Um, so from that perspective, uh, there is the question: what is the what is the uh, return achieved during that uh, ten year uh, uh, first ten years of of the investment? Um, and therefore, how much you rely on the next 20 years of your investment in order to achieve the, uh, uh, the, the total investment, uh, investment IRR. On the previous point, I would concur with, uh, with Benedict and team, right? and the, the uh, uh, financial leverage only exacerbates this, this dynamic um, and and the the first ten years will predominantly be used to to uh, repay the the financial debt, uh, leaving the leaving the um, investor much more exposed to to the long term power prices for uh, delivering the, the the return from investment. Yeah, but I wouldn't be too afraid about this the long the the, the, the merchant tail in the end. I mean. Certainly, and I think we can all agree, 2030, we will have a majority of production being renewable. However, it's floating, it's, it's, we cannot really predict, um, but we will also have, uh, um, we will see a much stronger grid and we see probably a lot of um, battery uh, or storage capacity on the grid already, which will be able, I think, to mitigate this fluctuation of renewables. And looking into, you know, all the stories with hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's no doubt commercially that renewable energies and in particular solar will make the race. Um, and if I look now into projects which I built like 20 years ago, if I look into the panels, if I look even onto those old, old 20 year old inverters, it's all still running and working. And these uh, installations are written off completely. So the kilowatt hour, the cost of the kilowatt hour, which is coming out of these kind of systems is zero, right? So the marginal cost of an additional kilowatt hour out of a written off solar plant comes for no cost at all. And this is something which would, should be easy uh, to be calculable against merchant prices in 20 years from now. So commercially, I don't see a limit. I see limits in grid capacity, I do see limits in local acceptance. I do see limits in, you know, the, the political discussion, how much space of our territories do we want to dedicate to solar instead of agriculture, producing food and all these kind of things. And we see these discussions already quite rising in many municipalities. 
I think maybe on to to pick up on that point, I think uh, you can take a lot of comfort that that um, uh, very very cheap power will be utilized differently by by humanity, and I think uh, uh, people uh, have already started today finding uh, good solutions in power to X and in 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 hydrogen and and uh, these kind of applications. Um, the question over specifically to 2030 is if uh, this these uh, solutions or uh, will be at the scale to absorb the power that will come from from the uh, rollout of renewables that that is expected over the over the next uh, 10 years. Um, so so longer term, I would agree that uh, there will be. Uh, very good support to to power prices can be below a certain uh, below a certain level from applications that have a negative exposure to to, to power prices and um, and thrive on on very cheap power. Um, I I think you know how quickly those kind of solutions are going to come into the system. That is probably uh, uh, a different question at this point in time. I think I will. I mean, yeah, and and that is the the, the risk that is being seen from um, from people who are doing project finance. That this is a transition period, and you don't know how this transition, how volatile prices will be during this transition. Maybe they stabilize in the long term, when everything is in a new equilibrium, and you have enough of demand for this for this energy. You have enough storage capacity. You have enough grid. But will all of that happen in the next 10 to 20 years where it counts is a big question. One thing that's for sure is when you look to Spain or to Scandinavia, people are investing on this assumption. That's, that's for sure. But, um, and also banks are financing on this assumption. But all of those risks will only materialize in 10 years from now or in seven years when you look at your futures for year 11. And so nobody knows at this point in time, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of cheap money, and there, there's people seem to have um, quite optimistic assumptions about the development of, of capture prices, even with a lot of renewables being injected in the system. And that's a bit of a bet. And if that, and it's not, and, and I, I can fully understand that from an equity perspective, but it's a bet that you, from a debt perspective, you would only like to to take for a certain degree. And it's all also very, I mean, every all of this is like a big chunk, which will be realized in 10 years from now, because most PPAs are 10 years. Uh, and uh, okay, it's shifting a bit now from year to year, but this, this is all very one directional risk that you're taking on your balance sheets there. And if it materializes, then you might have an issue. So that's why, why one can also be a bit hesitant on how much of this merchant revenues in year 11 to year 20 from now, how much of that can be um, yeah, can be um, used for project finance activities or for that? Yeah, but gentlemen, here's my assumption. We will have to, when we decarbonize this, this nation, the European Union or the entire world, uh, we will need so much renewable energy. That's just unbelievable. I just got numbers from the chemical industry in Germany. If they would... Uh, decarbonize all their processes and switch everything into electricity, they would need 600 terawatt hours per year, which is the total electricity consumption of Germany today. So only them turning into electricity, all their processes into electricity would double the electricity consumption of the entire country, Germany. And if we then look into the steel industry, the car industry, um, in the, pharma the pharmaceutical industries, there's so much of processes to, to, be, to be decarbonized and switched in somewhat electric processes, the demands will, will be terribly high. And for that, I'm very confident that we won't have a problem with, let's say, deploying the electricity we're going to produce. Then I hope I hope should re reconsider their market forecasts. Because I mean, their P50 is saying this 50 years, and we, we think that is quite um, that is quite progressive. And there 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 is an increase in demand in there, and there is storage in there, and there is no there will be I think pretty soon green hydrogen in there, and that's the base case. And then this can also deviate to the negative. It can also deviate to the positive, and I think that's the world you are describing there. Um, and the question is, where does this end up? And um, yeah, that's 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 the hesitant that 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 we that the debt side has. I would say. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.
maybe to add on that, and I think that's a very interesting discussion here because we are already talking about the different forms of risk. And um, I, I would fully agree and uh, to that being like solar, being even in Germany, probably the cheapest way of actually producing electricity even already now. Integration would be a second question. However, um, and, and, and also I would agree that we would say we will potentially, if we take um, decarbonization seriously, the net zero target until 2050 seriously, there's a lot more of electricity that we would actually need, meaning we would actually need way more renewables than we are actually thinking at the moment that we potentially need and are planning for. I, I think this is the thing which is actually still a bit independent of the risks that I wanted to, to uh, uh, talk about uh, with regards to what policy is actually doing, because of course, a, a lot of what we are discussing here at the moment is driven by, by policy measures. Uh, the, the government is, is, for example, pushing a lot when it comes to hydrogen. Um, CO2 price is something which is also driven a lot by policymakers. So um, we, we're not only having this, uh, the, the traditional risks in the energy system of uh, commodity prices, let's say, gas price using, uh, being, uh, being, being a main driver. In the future, maybe it's going to be uh, hydrogen prices. But what I personally currently see as the risk that I would be as an as a renewable investor most scared of is actually the policy risk, because um, if I would invest now in a renewable asset, um, believing in a market forecast, believing in market prices over the next 20, even 30 years, um, I always see this risk that the government wants to get faster and faster, which is which is a good thing because we want to reach higher renewable targets. But now we have been, for example, with the current EEG talking about 100 gigawatts of solar. Um, there have been already discussions, uh, SPD, for example, some, some, some members in, in the BMU has said maybe we actually need 150 gigawatts. And I think we will potentially really need these capacities. However, um, in, in the end, uh, 150 gigawatts with a slightly similar demand development means way lower capture prices. And uh, that means a, a lot of risk with regards to potential revenues. And I think this, this risk is independent of, um, of other developments that there's this, this inherent risk that policy moves onwards and our targets that we have maybe set at some years will be even increased. And this continuous increase could be a, could be a problem because my, my revenues that I was expecting will not realize anymore. So um, maybe to, to you, Mr. Ortman, how, how do you think, um, is, is, is PPA the only solution there that you, that you extend the PPA even longer? Because having only 10 years of, of uh, fixed revenues, I, I guess that's, that's getting a bit critical when we're really getting into this, this long run uncertainty and especially the policy uncertainties because there's, there's the upside, but there's also unfortunately a very, very big and probably even bigger downside potentially. Well, I mean, if you're afraid of policy changes, make yourself independent of policy. When we, when we were starting to develop this project you see here in the back, uh, I put it uh, in the back for you because this is our first subsidy-free um, <clears throat> big scale solar farm in Spain. And when we started the development, it was back in the time when the Spanish government just had retroactively cut their solar subsidies. So everybody called me an idiot that I was starting a solar development right then in time. But I said, well, if I make ourselves independent from the subsidy, then Spain is just a location. It's just a site. There's no Spanish risk adjacent to that. And it turned to be true. And when we do this now in Germany, I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid of any changes of the EEG anymore because I'm outside of that scope. Mm -hmm. When we do developments now in Poland, in Denmark, in Ukraine, in Greece, in Italy, we are doing it purely on market conditions. And we believe, we do believe that markets will sustain, mm. will be more attractive. Politics, of course, they can change. I would fully, fully agree to that, that it's, you, you, you're saving yourself from the, the potential changes with regards to renewable regulation and potential subsidy payments. Yes, but I also see the problem that uh, the regulation not only uh, interferes maybe with the subsidy payments, as, as you have seen in Spain or other countries, but um, if, if there will be a lot of renewable pushed into the system from the government through subsidies, um, that will go on your market revenues. And this, this could be a potential risk, right? 
because that's that's something that you cannot control as for example if grid levies will be will be increased and we see even more uh, uh, decentralized PV or we see even more offshore being pushed in the system because there it will be more and more NIMBY, eff uh, NIMBY effects and uh, offshore timeline will be increased further on and, and, and capture, rates is, capture rates will drop. Yeah, well, I mean, every subsidy has to pay some, has to be paid by somebody. And I mean, the, the effect of the cuts in, 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 in Spain and in Germany also uh, was, um, and, and the reason for that was that we were, we were paying too much money for, for this uh, renewable energies. And I think every government in this world will, 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 will start to decrease their subsidy levels as they see um, merchant projects coming up. And you should not forget one thing. If a Google or an Amazon is uh, buying electricity from the EEG, they don't get any credit from that. They don't get any certificate or whatever in order to, to, to set off their electricity consumption from their CO2, they have to buy unsubsidized green electricity. Otherwise, it's not, they cannot double, double count it, right? And for that, uh, there is a mature demand for unsubsidized green electricity because this is the only way for corporates and uh, uh, industrial customers to offset their, their CO2. I think, Casimir, probably the, the scenario that you are describing there is, is the deep decarbonization scenario uh, that is also combined with, with a much higher demand from, uh, from uh, uh, the other parts of the economy for, for decarbonizing their, their, uh, their uh, sectors. Um, so, and that, that only makes sense in the context of, of uh, relatively um, lower priced uh, power, right? Uh, that that that, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, new renewables are are unsustainable. I think we we all expect to uh, continue to see a decrease in the LCOE of of renewables, both solar and onshore wind and offshore wind. And so, even if uh, uh, power prices remain roughly at say today's levels. Um, they will they will uh, uh, continue to potentially be sufficient to to generate a, an adequate return for uh, for the investor. So, is there a scenario where where the government is is pushing for for significantly higher uh, uh, renewables in the absence of of a of a demand uh, in 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 the in the economy? I think that you know that that is probably. Difficult to see why they would impose uh, costs on the on the uh, bill payer through through such a mechanism. So I think yeah, th th it all needs to be seen as part of uh, 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 one bigger context. I would I would argue. Yeah, thank thank you very much. I think that that's that's a very good point. But if we um, maybe but then we we think it even a bit further and think about what what would be the implications of uh, when we have such a positive view on the renewable developments in the future um, and also on, with regards to capture prices, I think or uh, maybe that, that's also a question uh, to, to all of you. Will PPAs be the, the point um, which we will always need or will we actually come into a world where we will see, um, let's say, fully merchant investment? So, um, we, we have been talking already about the fact that some of these investments here have been anyhow being fully equity without any uh, banks involved. Um, why, why still take this PPA, take the, of course, the transaction cost of handling a PPA, finding the right off taker, um, and then potentially also paying even a discount. At least that's what we're currently seeing, seeing on the market that due to being a buyer's market, the PPA can is, is slightly lower or sometimes even significantly lower compared to expectations on, on capture prices. So do you think we will, we will always be in a PPA world or will we manage maybe to go into a really fully merchant world where, where we, uh, we will build renewables and just believe that there will be sufficient market returns and maybe even banks will believe that at some point. 
Well, uh, that goes into my, sorry, go, go ahead. Go, go Tim, go. <laughs> Because banks were mentioned. I, I, I can't envision it, but I mean, a lot of things that, uh, that you couldn't envision for 20 years ago happened. And so that's, that's hard to say, but I would still argue, I mean, there's no um, long-term financing available for assets around the world within renewables or without. I mean, Radu maybe was one to comment on that, which have project finance on it, which have a su su uh, substantial price risk. So that is something which, I mean, at least historically, didn't happen. That, uh, that were, this was all balance sheet investments and there was equity which was taking this risk and obviously on the balance sheet, overall balance sheet that was leveraged, but not on an asset base. And so um, if you ask me if I can envision, I mean, there are fully merchant project finances, but let's be honest about that. There are a few banks in Spain who are doing it, but I think there's very limited balance sheet capacity within banks for such type of investments. And so I, that's a case I don't see. And it would be very unfortunate if we, if we would be out of the game because everything would be done based on balance sheet investments. But that might be a scenario. Radu, please. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I would concur. I think there are probably two, two buckets that, that would compete on that front, right? One is the, the utilities that, that essentially, they, as I was saying earlier, right, they, they can internalize the PPA by not contract, they contract with themselves, right? Um, or or Deutsche Bahn kind of setting up, you know, they 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 set up a dedicated team that 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 goes and and rolls out uh, solar PV projects uh, in order to also capture the full greenfield premium that 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 comes from from these projects, for example, right? Um, and then also kind of smaller scale, much smaller scale uh, uh, projects. Where um, with money with money that people can afford to lose, right? And 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 they just uh, they are being invested on uh, on a on a fully merchant uh, basis. When it comes to the to the projects that we are discussing on on this panel that uh, require uh, tens and hundreds of millions of uh, euros of of investment, I think it is difficult uh, to see from today's perspective how an investment decision can be made uh, to allocate this entire capital uh, without uh, some degree of protection on the, on the cash flows. And the good thing here, of course, is that, that uh, uh, costs are, are very predictable. Um, can, we, can we make sure that, that we have the, uh, uh, the revenues uh, predictable, at least for, for an initial period of time, Um, and 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 then we can um, uh, we can make our own assumptions what will happen afterwards. Yeah, I think that's correct because there's there's a fundamental difference between a conventional power plant and a renewable power plant. The conventional power plant costs has has a low opex, but the fuel for it is coming at a cost, right? For a renewable asset, you have huge opex but the fuel for the renewable plant is coming for zero. So you have a big upfront cost, and then you hope to generate, to recover from your upfront cost. In, on, the, on the conventional generator side, you can steer it easily, right? And you don't have a, such a big upfront risk when you do the, the, the first investment. And for that, I think, yes, it is easier to go for a fully merchant scheme on a conventional power plant rather than on a renewable. However, having said that, Tim, you were mentioning that there are already fully merchant uh, renewable projects also uh, operating, but I'm not so sure if the investors are so happy with it. No. Now, uh, with, with, what happened, with what happened last year as well and kind of the, the recent fluctuations, people who invested on a fully merchant basis previously, um probably are, are having second thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one thing that comes to mind in terms of from, from structuring or financial perspective, one thing we see a lot in, in the US financial markets are shorter tenors while structuring over the full period, let's say 17 or 18 years, but then you have five year or seven year legal maturity and then you have a bullet. And this is something where banks feel more comfortable with taking the long-term merchant risk because at this point in time, you have a completely new refinancing process. 
And if investors would be very confident in their assumptions and their initial assumptions, they shouldn't have an issue with this refinancing risk. But obviously, they're taking on board an additional risk, the risk of refinancing, the risk of repricing, the risk of a new structure, which happens at that point in time. But we are seeing that spilling over to Europe right now um, for at least, the way you say, you're doing construction bridges plus one and two years, and people are hoping to have then a, a, a prudent PPA in place to, to, to gain some, um, some of the additional value in the projects. And so this is something that I could see happening that, that, that um, structures change a bit to accommodate and then ba make banks more, more, more comfortable with taking all, a bit higher leverage ratios overall by having a bit more of control over the lifetime of the assets of how, the, how, how, how things are going. So that, that's just a minor point. I don't, it, I don't think it will save subsidy free or so, but it will, it will help in having project finance within subsidy free projects to a higher degree than the, I don't know, 50 or 60% that you see or yeah, that you see maybe then in Spain or so. Yeah. And may, maybe that's a very good point, like looking also a bit, we, we have already looked sometimes at Spain. Um, do, do you think with regards to this uh, subsidy free Germany is compared maybe to the Nordics, to Spain, clearly not a front runner, um, but what are there that we can learn really from these other countries that have maybe a longer experience, longer experience with PPA? Um, what, what do you think are learnings, maybe errors that these country did that we don't have to do again or that hopefully Germany uh, investors in Germany are not doing again? Um, I'm also thinking about the Nordics where there has been a lot of PPA signed um, and yeah, uh, expectancy has been also different from from um, from what happens after the PPA with regards to market revenues and so forth. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear your opinion on the comparison of Germany to other countries, especially countries which were uh, already a bit further ahead. And maybe also if you have an idea why the other countries are so much to some extent further ahead than, than Germany. Well, this is very easy. That's a very easy reason for that. Uh, we started in Spain because here in Sevilla, we have like 1,500 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak, even on the fixed tilt, and which is 30% more revenue on the same panel than, if, than you would have the same installation in Germany, full stop. And at the time, um, the LCOE were not down at that level as they are today. So it was purely a question of, of LCOEs and nothing else. Yeah. Um, and there is no special kind of experience uh, in the Spanish market as such, or in the Italian market or the Greece market as such with regards to PPAs. PPAs are straightforward and have been used for a long time also for uh, not renewable, but for conventional assets. So that's common knowledge. Um, so to my, to my experience, actually, no, there was no, there was no kind of learning in this respect, in this so respect. You, so also maybe, say, not, sorry, go ahead. So, so what I what I would say, Kai, you know, if you look at uh, what happened specifically in the Spanish market uh, in 2017, 2018, and um, that that uh, created the impetus for for people to to come and provide the, the PPAs in the uh, in the Spanish market, and combined with with a low LCOE. What we have seen in Spain is 100% market market driven, um, and 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 um, in a way the success of EEG and and the 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 rollout of renewables under EEG in Germany has acted as a little bit of a break uh, on 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 the on the development of of subsidy free uh, renewables in 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 Germany. Um, if you look also uh, at the Nordics, I think there again the, the market has had to find um, uh, to find its own uh, its own uh, investment merits off the back of uh, attractive LCOE. Uh, in that case, uh, for for wind rather than solar, for obvious reasons, um, and again deployed at scale with benefits of scale, with economies of scale, and and in a way that uh, enables. Uh, large-scale projects to to have a very low LCOE, and and it is important kind to to focus on that. Uh, it is the low operating cost that gives you the comfort 
that you will be competitive uh, even when you come out of the out of the PPA period and being able to to dispatch or in the generate uh, uh, generate power at, at at low cost is probably one of the most important elements of uh, of investing in renewables. That's the major difference, I would say, compared also to the mistakes that have been made also on our side. I mean, when, when projects were financed on a PPA basis in 2009, for example, then market prices were at 80 euros per megawatt and PPA prices for five-year PPAs were at 60 euros per megawatt. And everybody was saying afterwards, it will be substantially above 60 euros per megawatt. And then came the financial crisis. And then you wake up at the end of your five-year PPA and then you are at 40 euros and you don't have that low levelized cost of energy. You cannot survive as a 40 euro PPA. And then you really have an issue. And that's the one thing that if we look at it at this point in time, which gives a bit more comfort than if you say, okay, the value of electricity cannot go for the long term below zero and also maybe not below 20 or whatever. We are at um, OPEX where, where those assets can survive and, and where there's even positive cash flow is quite, at quite low prices. So the um, potential to go down substantially and really uh, wake up with a bad headache uh, is substantially lower than if you are financing as very very high cost of energy with high with high OPEX. So that's maybe one comforting thing, so to say, that prices are already quite low and OPEX uh, SUEs have also drop, dropped so drastically. But I mean, you see, if they drop again so drastically, then everybody who, who invests today has an issue <laughs> because uh, <laughs> this is electricity. But we'll see. And, and maybe that, I think that's also an interesting point to start thinking about because of course, we, we are at a certain level of electricity prices and specifically capture prices at the moment. Going forward, we're all expecting to see some uh, further learning rates in, in the PV area, uh, but also maybe wind offshore and, and, and maybe even slightly in the wind onshore area. That means future assets will always be cheaper. So in a way, if we, we, we invest now, log in a PPA, in the end of, at the end of the PPA, there's potentially a high chance that the prices will be lower than... What, what they have been at the PPA. Um, but I, I assume from, from what you have been uh, saying before is also that this is not a problem for the asset because revenues have been made already in during that high, high period time. And actually all the, the assets are pl must plan with potentially lower and always lowering capture prices because otherwise um, markets wouldn't make sense if technology and LCEs are falling, capture prices have to fall also in the in the long run, would you would you agree to that or would you would you oppose that? I think you're leaving demand out of the equation, right? Because I think that this was Benedict is saying that I mean, uh, if if prices would be also also always at the margin, then I think a lot of investors who are investing today will have an issue in ten years' time. The question is, will prices be at the, at, the, at the margin of the newly constructed assets or is there so much demand that the actual price level will be higher and so that those assets that will be newly constructed are just much more profitable maybe. And somewhere in between might be the truth. So that's... Um, <laughs> Uh, but look, look, look what's happening in Spain, right? Where where there is a clear prospect of of uh, having quite a few hours of of uh, solar at uh, very low prices, given the given the amount of uh, solar that comes in, uh, uh, in uh, is on stream to come uh, in in Spain, right? Uh, and that has been recognized both by private um, investors and by by uh, the government there is a clear drive to to make the spanish market as uh, uh, as one of the leading markets for uh, for hydrogen and there are uh, other initiatives and and there is no doubt you you have uh, power priced at zero coming from uh, offshore wind or from solar on from People will find very good ways to to put that power to work in a in a meaningful way, and they will they will pay for that 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 power, uh, 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 except for maybe a period of transition, will not remain priced at zero for for too long. Um, it's it's simply too valuable a good for for people to to give it up simply like that. And there's also one interesting fact if you compare wind and solar with with each other. Um, what I just said with the, you know, after 20 years, the electricity is coming for free out of the solar generator. That's true for solar, but I'm afraid it's not true for wind. 
because we have, you know, we have wear and tear, we have gearboxes uh, falling apart, we have uh, wind blades breaking. It's a mechanical machine. And this machine has wear and tear. And you have to repower it after a certain number of years, maybe 25, but latest then I would guess uh, it would make sense to repower. So you have to have a new investment. Or even if you use the return of wind turbine, you have quite significant maintenance and operation costs. So, uh, and for that, I think it's also an advantage to be in solar rather than in wind because the, the electricity is even cheaper coming from solar on the long end. Thank you. Yeah, I think also picking up maybe the thought that Tim, Tim has brought in and, and, and referring also to, to what you have said, Mr. Ortman, before, that in order, uh, the, the demand is a big, big point at this equation. And also, as, as you have said, Radu, hydrogen can also stabilize. Um, but I understand from that that in Germany, uh, for example, when we say we have a lot of renewables coming in the system, um, they might be at the margin or the prices be the ones that are at the margin, then we potentially have a problem. But of course, if we get in a situation where we have more demand for electricity, or let's say pre more precisely, more demand for for um, uh, electricity from photovoltaics or during the production of that, let it be due to very flexible industry, let it be due to hydrogen, for example, stabilizing the loads, that would be a situation that would uh, save us to some extent from too low capture prices because we will not be cannibalizing us too much, but we will have the chance that there is not enough space even to, to build enough or not fast enough. Is, is that something which, which I interpret right, uh, uh, Tim and, and Mr. Ortman? I guess it was the, that, that, it's, that was the point that I was making. I, I have to say, I mean, we, we doubt that, that that will happen, at least in the transition period. And that's the period we have to look at right now for assets we are financing right now. In the, in the long run, it, it makes completely sense what Osorado has said in, from, from an overall economic perspective. But the question is, will that happen in the next 15 years? And will be the, will be there in terms of decarbonization? And that's what I am interested in right now. From a more global perspective, then, you could say, okay, in the long run, it will be all good and there will be a few, few people who suffer and a few banks who suffer. And, uh, uh, but that's not the way I look at this problem, right? But in, uh, maybe generally speaking, that is, the, that, is, that is the right interpretation, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, for the long run, you could, you could envisage um, a picture saying, okay, Maybe all the renewable electricity will then come out of the Sahara or stuff like this. I don't think so, because there's a balance of local generation and transporting uh, electricity from very far regions. Uh, it will very much depend on how we build out our grids. And um, uh, so it will have to come somewhat all together, right? And... Um, if you ask me personally, I would guess that we will have still a mix of own generation and import of energy from, from anywhere abroad. Um, may it be via electricity lines or may it be via hydrogen being produced in Spain or in, in Africa or uh, elsewhere. So I, I guess um, we, are, we are approaching this kind of scenario more and more Yeah, uh, yeah for that. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, also looking a bit at the time, we, we are at the, the end of our panel. And uh, I think we could have talked here, especially when we're going a bit in the direction of potential import, looking more at hydrogen, how that all plays together. I think there are various points of uh, discussion where we could go even a bit further. So thank you so much uh, for the discussion we had so far. Maybe as a, a quick uh, last statement for, for those of you who want I would be interested in, in what you think would be the, 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 the supporting measures, let it be from policy, let it be technology, let it be from the market that would uh, help us um, even, for, uh, even grow even more uh, the, 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 or increase even more the velocity of subsidy-free build-out of renewables in Germany. Um, maybe, uh, Mr. Ortmann, uh, you, you give it a start. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, let me make the statement. We do still need subsidies. We do need them for small applications and we need them for 
new and special applications such as floating solar, agri-solar, building integrated. Why do we need all these kind of special uh, applications? Because we are uh, we are in the need of having space, right? S space is scar, and we see that if we only build out like big scale ground mounted installations, we will have issues with the local acceptance. Secondly, um, we need um, the municipalities to profit from those uh, installations. Right now, this is not the case in Germany. We see it in other countries that this is working quite well. And we also need to harmonize our system with, uh, let's say, the subsidy schemes coming from the European Union. Mainly, if it's agricultural subsidies coming from the European Union, this is in not matching with subsidy schemes um, in Germany. For instance, if I want to build out an upsum, an unsubsidized installation in Germany, the farmer loses automatically his subsidies coming from the European Union. And there's a, a couple of other um, instruments we could, we could apply in order to foster more of these. But let me say that mainly we have to have this parallel schemes of having unsubsidized in parallel to uh, your EEG subsidized installations for the next coming years. Thank you. I mean, Kazimir, I think you, you made earlier the, the point quite clearly that that uh, subsidized and unsubsidized uh, parts of the parts of the element um, uh, are very much uh, or, or need to work in tandem um, and and are influencing each other. So from that perspective, uh, in the context of um, uh, uh, nuclear power plants and coal fired power plants leaving the system, uh, what is important for all the investors is to understand how how the German power uh, uh, system is going to work uh, over the medium to to long term. Um, all these investments are are predicated on uh, on on long term decisions, and uh, and they there needs to be predictability as to as to how the the system uh, will will work. Um, Solar is good, uh, but clearly, you know, there's only that many hours in the day when you can when you can capture that power. So the, the, there needs to be um, the the night demand and the peak demand. Uh, the, the, those kind of questions need to be uh, addressed appropriately. What is the the role of uh, storage? Whether that's hydrogen, that's whether that's pump storage, whether the, there are uh, imports. Uh, however, that is structured. Um, uh, I think it is it is very important for for investors, whether debt or equity, to have that visibility and predictability and confidence that uh, a, a change in government, for example, is not going to completely destroy. Uh, uh, assumptions that uh, have been underwritten previously in uh, for for a for a specific investment. Um, yeah, I would say there are uh, very very specific issues that uh, and very specific aspects that would be relevant for each subsector. But but overall, from my perspective, is that um, uh, overall picture that is is most important for people to make informed decision. Yeah, I mean, maybe adding up on this, um, I would completely agree with Radu, and I think that brings up an interesting point. I previously said banks are not the right party in the overall game to take merchant risk. And I think what Radu has just said, that in such a transitional period as we are right now, maybe investors are also not the right ones. The equity maybe is not, because the one who is determining how this transition will happen, at what degree, with what, how much volatility, is the state. So maybe if you want to achieve such ambitious targets as we need right now, maybe then the state needs to take out a lot of the risk. And there are various ways of doing this. I like the idea, for example, of backing up PPAs of lower, um, of, of, to, of lower um, quality um, counterparties, for example, and providing like this an additional um, um, PPA volume because PPA volume is scarce in terms of investment grade counterparties. And so that could um, further the thing. But I think overall, I would still be of the opinion that maybe switching to a CFD regime to this auctions to get like really precise price points at what is needed over 20 years right now for investor to do the investment, what are, to getting investments at the right levelized cost of energy and taking out this uncertainty, at least for the period of transition, 
until you have a more clear idea of how the future market regime would look like and the future capacity mix might be a good idea to achieve those um, um, political targets needed for carbon zero. Thank you, Tim. I think that that was actually a, a great wrap up and also uh, from, from Mr. Altman and uh, Radu, thank you very much for, for your finalizing comments and uh, th then at the same time being like a wrap up. So I will keep mine very short and I, I fully agree. And first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to see that um, the, the, the investors and, and the whole community and the uh, stakeholders are very positive about uh, market-based and subsidy-free renewables in the future. Um, there are various fields. I think one big takeaway for me was also to see that it really depends on the scale. Big scale has a big advantage and that allows you to also mitigate uh, part of these risks that, that we have seen there and that policy risk um, and also market risk is not that important anymore if you can get the, the LCE numbers down and also have this long, long merchant tail. I, I also really liked the idea that in the end, for example, hydrogen has, has, a, has a big impact and will have a big impact, of course. Um, and generally, the, the last point that, that has just been made, that in the end, we have this transition period, which is the critical one in the long run. We all know we go to 2050, it's, it's a bit more clarity and uh, no more nuclear and coal power plants will be in there. But the transition period is probably the, the risky times also policy having a big impact here. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we only opened the point of CFDs only now because we'll probably need another hour and I can just close the panel now without <laughs> allowing for too much uh, discussions on that. But it was, it was great to discuss with you. Thank you very much for, for joining me virtually here. Uh, and um, yeah, I can only say thank you from me and also from the, the whole team. Thank you. Thanks very much, Casimir. Thanks. Thanks, Casimir.